Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our uh, webinar today, um, The Keys to Effective Low Barrier Emergency Shelters. My name is Anna Blasco, and I'm going to um, just get us started with some logistics. Um, so yes, all of our, our lines today are on mute, um, but we do want you to ask questions. Uh, you can ask a question at any time by typing it into the questions box. We're not sure if we're going to have time to answer a whole bunch of those today, but we are um, collecting all of them, and we are going to be releasing a frequently asked questions document. Uh, so we definitely want to hear what your questions are throughout, so please don't be shy. Um, type those into the questions box. I'll go ahead and answer a pretty popular question right now, which is yes, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, you'll be able to access that uh, once the webinar is over. We'll email it out to everyone who registered. Um, but I've also just put a message in the chat box, which has a link to the um, emergency shelter section of our website, wh where we will post the recording um, once this webinar is over. So now with that, I'm going to turn this over to Cynthia Najendra to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Anna said, I am Cynthia Najendra, the director of the Alliance's Center for Capacity Building. And I am grateful to be joined today by my fabulous colleague, Anna, uh, who's also a technical assistance specialist here. And she's actually currently working with dozens of shelters across the state of Georgia on implementing the model we will be discussing today. We are really excited to be delivering the second installment in the Alliance's Emergency Shelter Learning Series. And if you attended or listened to the recording of the first webinar, thanks for coming back. Uh, we have almost 200 people filled out the self-assessment survey that we had um, sent out online. And we want to thank you for doing so. And we're going to talk about some of those results today. And hopefully it has started discussions in your shelters and communities about how to start implementing these changes to your shelters. Uh, we look forward to seeing what you have to report this month, and we'll be asking some questions throughout the webinar. So for those of you who are new to this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to the first webinar. It's on our, um, on our website, and check out the self-assessment tool that you can download from this webinar as well, as well as from our webpage on emergency shelters. The link for our page can be found right on this slide. And don't worry, if you haven't listened to that first webinar, you can join this webinar without, having, uh, without missing anything and probably get a lot out of this one. Before we begin, I would like to again acknowledge that operating an emergency shelter is one of the most difficult jobs there is. And we are really grateful for the often life-saving work that you are doing in your communities. This series is really meant to help communities and shelters build on that important work that shelters already do to respond to homelessness and shift in ways that will benefit people experiencing homelessness. And so in this series, we will probably several times also acknowledge that change is really, really hard. And doing things differently can be really anxiety provoking. We are working with many shelters experiencing this transition. And we hope you will hear about strategies and experiences from other shelters that are that is going to make your work easier more rewarding and ultimately improve outcomes for people experiencing homelessness in your community. And this series is really meant to give you some tools to do that. The primary goals of this series are to help communities strengthen their shelter policies and services to improve the housing outcomes for people experiencing homelessness, to implement a system-wide approach to ending homelessness that includes emergency shelters. We know emergency shelters um, sometimes have not been part of the larger system-wide conversations, and they're really critical to a, a really effective crisis response system and really need to be at the table. Another goal is to align emergency shelters' goals with the larger community's goals to end homelessness and to provide low, low barrier, safe, and housing-focused shelter, which we will talk about quite a lot today. So over the next six months or so, or as long as you decide to participate, we want to not just provide information, but also guide shelters to action, to accomplish the following activities during the course of the series, so that you're building on the great work you're already doing to solve homelessness in your community by aligning your shelters with these recommended practices. And over the coming months, uh, you'll be understanding the role of shelter in a crisis response system. That's what we talked about last month. Uh, we also tried to help you assess how your shelter currently aligns with the key elements to effective emergency shelter. Again, those self-assessments are available here. 
We will talk today about how to implement the key elements to effective emergency shelter, and we'll be talking about those elements over the next few webinars. We're all hoping also to help you develop goals, action plans, and a timeline to make that shift to a low barrier housing focused shelter model. The self-assessments come with uh, action plans that hopefully will start those discussions in your community. We think that sort of just setting 30-day action plans, 60-day action plans can really help get the work started. Uh, we also want you to be able to track shelter metrics. We'll talk about that today. That's another handout that's available from the webinar. If you look in your handout section, uh, a shelter metrics form, and we'll talk through that today as well. And establish benchmarks to improve shelter and system outcomes. The primary goal of the series is to help communities, oops, sorry, uh, we will offer a variety of tools to help you implement these changes in your community. So we'll be providing a series of webinars, um, <clears throat> as well as some tools, some guidance. We'll hear from other shelters. That'll be our next webinar, which I think will be really helpful, uh, hearing the transition they've been through, how they tackled certain challenges and anxieties, and how they got to the other side. Um, and we really encourage you to use the online assessments again, that are downloadable <clears throat> from our website and from here to sort of get that work started. I want to tell you a little bit about how we arrived here and some of the work we've been doing. So for the past couple of years, we've made a focused effort to learn as much as we could from the field about what effective shelter practices really look like on the ground and how they impact homelessness in their communities. So we looked at national data and research. Uh, we talked a bit about that last month. And we interviewed shelters across the country in different geographies that serve different various, uh, serve various populations. We asked about housing outcomes, length of stay, staffing, rules, eligibility criteria, levels of integration into coordinated entry, if you have that in your community, uh, and just generally your connections to the rest of the crisis response system. And from that, we really started to see some common key elements of shelters that had good housing outcomes for their clients. And we've also been working in various communities across the country to guide their shelters transition from high barrier to a low barrier housing focused model that's better integrated into their overall crisis response system. And we want to thank the many experts we have consulted that have helped us come to these keys. I want to give a special shout out to Org Code Consulting, who has helped provide a lot of their experience and know-how, and to many of the shelter staff who've spent hours on the phone with us letting us ask questions and understand their shelter models. So in summary, these are how the keys to effective shelter were developed. And we've learned a lot through these engagements and continue to learn, so we welcome your feedback about what works, what doesn't, and what innovations you are trying that, you, that can be shared with other communities. We're going to be also uh, sending out a survey question uh, at the end of the webinar uh, that will ask you to share what challenges you're experiencing in, in <clears throat> implementing low barrier shelter. And we're going to use your answers to inform our next webinar to help you work through those challenges. Before we launch into the main topic, I want to acknowledge also that you may have a lot of concerns or questions. And these are common concerns that we have heard from many shelters, and we want to help you work through them. Um, and just you know, sort of acknowledge that these are really normal questions to have. We're going to try to address all of these concerns over the next few months. Um, and over time and through experience, hopefully, you will find that some of the concerns will change or disappear as you start to experience more success. Throughout the series, we're also going to be asking you where you find yourself on the scale of transformational change. Many of you might be on that left side of the scale starting to recognize a need to change because what you're doing isn't working as well as you want. It is likely that you will go through various stages of change as you work through this process for transforming your shelter. Confusion, anxiety, a sense of loss, because you're changing the way you've worked for a really long time. And that can be really scary. And you're hopefully eventually arriving at Clarity to develop a new vision. And hopefully it doesn't take as long as you think it might. Okay, so in a second you should see a poll on your screen. Um, we want to know where you are in your transformational change. Um, so are you more on that left side of recognizing the need, perhaps in the middle feeling confusion, anxiety, or loss? Um, perhaps you're reaching clarity about the need for change or a new vision for change. Or finally, maybe you're already on the side of integrating and restructuring in response to the change. Um, so just take a second and fill out the poll. It looks like a little bit less than half of, of you have voted. So we're going to give you just a couple more seconds to um, 
tell us where you think you are in this uh, in this transformational change. Okay, I think about 65% of you have voted. So just if you haven't yet, give us just a few more so we can get over that 70% mark. Okay, so I think about 72% of you have voted. So let me close the poll and show you guys your results. Um, so it looks like 26% uh, of you are in the left side of that um, transformational change, recognizing the need. So it's great that you're on this webinar because you're realizing that there might be some need for change, uh, some confusion, anxiety, and loss, but then a good amount of people on the other side feeling um, that they have clarity and new vision for change and you're already integrating and restructuring in response to change. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to hide the poll and we'll go back to the... PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. Thanks, Anna. So this, th those results kind of reflect, uh, um, I think, what we saw in our self-assessments, actually. Uh, so this shelter self-assessment that we asked uh, people to fill out, we had about uh, almost 200 responses. And here's just one of those responses. But uh, we'll be kind of talking about some of the results throughout. This is a question that uh, asks whether your shelter has time limitations that make people uh, leave every morning at a certain time, stay outside during the day, and then have to line up for their beds at night. And here we see that 43% of you strongly agree that they do not have these policies. They don't have that type of schedule. 21% agree that they don't do this. About 34% of people do seem to have this type of schedule where people have to line up um, in, the, in the evening and leave in the morning. And so we're going to discuss today why having a schedule like this does not align itself with the low barrier model. And we'll kind of talk about how you might be able to change that. All right, so let's get our next poll question out here. So for this poll, we want to know, um, how have you started working on your uh, action plans that you guys filled out uh, self-assessment? So have you actually started making any changes in the last month since um, our first webinar? Perhaps you've already started talking about eliminating drug testing or other high barrier policies. Uh, you're focusing your services more on, on housing rather than all this other stuff. Um, maybe you're changing your rules to make it easier to stay in shelter or relaxing your hours or curfew to make it more accessible. And we'd really like to hear if there's any other changes you've made. So if this doesn't describe what you've done, but you've already started um, changing some, uh, some things, let us know by entering that into the chat box. OK, I see somebody said all of the above. Very cool. Um, anybody else want to enter stuff into the chat box? OK, no changes yet. Sure, that's OK. Uh, but I'm getting a good amount of responses, so let's see if we, how many folks have voted. Only 43% have voted. I guess we didn't give people a no changes option, so maybe that's why some of you aren't voting yet. But um, I'm going to uh, close the poll now, and please feel free to keep entering stuff into the chat box that you've already done, but I will share these results with you now. So. Um, it's really interesting that a lot of you have already started developing housing-focused services, refocusing your uh, services on housing. That's great. Um, changing rules to make it easier to stay in shelters, fantastic. Um, some of you have already started eliminating drug testing or other high barrier policies. Uh, some have started adjusting their hours to make shelter more accessible. And we have a lot of folks who've entered stuff in the chat box about um, changes they've already made. So that's fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to hide this poll and we'll go back to the PowerPoint. So it, it is interesting to see what people are putting in the chat box and we're definitely going to uh, look at those things um, after the webinar and kind of get a sense for the kinds of changes people are making. I want to note that someone said, you know, we don't have funding yet so we're not able to make these changes. And I want to say that I, I completely understand that uh, a lot of these changes, especially for those of you that don't have a lot of staff, some of you I know are operating with skeletal staff and resources, sometimes just volunteers. Some of these changes can seem really daunting. And the way we have tried to uh, lay out this model is with the understanding that you might not have any resources or extra resources to do this. And we understand that that means you might not be able to, say, go 24-7 um, because you don't have the staffing. But by and large, a lot of the shelters we've, we're working with um, in these different areas of the country don't have new resources. And what's been really illuminating is 
uh, seeing them able to make changes with what they have. A lot of times that means realigning what they're doing, doing things differently and not trying to add things. Certainly uh, that might mean you know you need to retrain staff and do things like that that may require resources. But if you don't have extra resources, which you most of you probably don't, it's a very resource scarce environment, uh, try to think about how you might be able to move things around in your budget and do things differently rather than adding things on. So we'll talk we'll talk more about that. So today's webinar, we're going to discuss the following questions. What are the keys to effective low barrier shelter? How should shelters implement the keys? To these keys to effective low barrier shelters, how should communities assess their performance and of, of their shelters, and how should communities align the goals of shelter with system performance outcomes? We have a lot of content to cover today, as I said, on the five key elements, and because there's a lot to cover, we will give you an overview, but we will drill down into some of these key elements even further in future webinars. So just want to let you know that. The five key elements to effective shelters are having a housing first approach, practicing safe and appropriate diversion, ensuring your shelter provides immediate and low barrier access, making your shelter housing focused with rapid exits to housing services, and using your data to measure your shelter's effectiveness and make shelter design decisions. There is an infographic in the handout section uh, that you see of this cute little house, um, which is supposed to be a shelter, um, that you can download from the webinar or from our website. As I said in the last webinar, when you're thinking of making these shifts, and I'm sure many of you already have this experience, there are really three areas that really um, will we'll sh we'll need to shift to make this transition to a shelter that incorporates these key elements. Your shelter will likely have to make a philosophical shift, and that means that all of your staff, your executive director, maybe your board, uh, perhaps your donors, will need to make that philosophical shift. There will have to be a practice shift, as well as a shift in the way you actually operate your shelter, including hours of operation, staffing, the way you utilize space. Uh, we won't spend much time um, talking about all of these things today, but again, we will do a deeper dive into some of those shifts. Okay, so let's start with the first key element, which is the housing first approach. Um, so you may be wondering why uh, or how a shelter, which provides temporary crisis housing can use a housing first approach when shelter itself is not a permanent housing intervention. Well, uh, housing first is a philosophical approach at its core. And it promotes that housing is first and foremost, homelessness is first and foremost a housing problem. Uh, everyone is ready for shelter immediately. People should be returned to or stabilized in permanent housing as quickly as possible and connected to the resources needed to stay in housing and that issues that contributed to someone's homelessness can best be addressed once they are permanently housed. Now, using a housing first approach may require a significant philosophical shift in your current shelter design and how you deliver services. It also means that everyone on staff, from the executive director to the intake coordinator, is also going to have to make this philosophical shift in order to operate an effective low barrier shelter and have positive housing outcomes. So Housing First is based on the evidence that for most people experiencing homelessness, intensive services are not necessary. Most people experiencing homelessness fall into it one time after a crisis and need only minimal assistance to return to housing. So what does this look like in practice? First, uh, there are few to no programmatic prerequisites to permit housing entry. For example, no requirements that people must find a job before being able to look for housing, for example. Uh, admissions policies for shelter and for being referred to housing resources are low barrier. And there's a focus on helping individuals and families access and sustain permanent housing as quickly as possible. Finally, supportive services in a housing first shelter or rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing program is always voluntary. So here's another uh, result from your emergency shelter self-assessments that you submitted. 
Um, so we asked uh, if you felt like your mission statements reflected a housing first approach. And 80% of you either strongly agreed or agreed that the mission of your shelter reflects the housing first approach. However, when we asked if um, your eligibility criteria to enter shelter does not restrict access to shelter because of the use of alcohol, drugs, uh, lack of income, criminal history or background, or because the person has a pet, only 58% of people agreed or strongly agreed. This indicates that though a shelter's mission statement may say they are a housing first approach, your eligibility criteria may not reflect that approach because it imposes a lot of criteria that screens people out who need shelter. Uh, Cynthia is going to talk a little bit more about a low barrier approach to emergency shelter when she gets to the immediate low barrier access part of this webinar. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia to talk about the next core component, our key element, uh, safe and appropriate diversion. Thanks, Anna. So uh, another question we asked on the self-assessment is whether your shelter is using diversion to help identify, identify safe alternatives to shelter. And actually a good amount of people said that uh, they were using diversion practices. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about what uh, diversion is uh, and why it's important. Diversion is a strategy that prevents homelessness by helping people experiencing a housing crisis and seeking shelter to preserve their current housing situation if that's where they're coming from or make immediate alternative arrangements without having to enter shelter. Why is diversion so important to implement for shelter? Well, many shelters really don't have the capacity to accommodate everyone who needs shelter. I'm sure many of you have that experience in your communities. You have waiting lists, you have to say no to people, uh, you're just not able to accommodate the people who are unsheltered in your community because you don't have space. So are there ways to help people seeking shelter that provide them with better options? So done well, diversion can cut down on shelter wait lists, diversion can conserve and target precious shelter resources, uh, so people are using shelter beds only when absolutely needed, and it can improve quality of life for people by helping them avoid the stress and the difficulty of shelter stays if they have a better option. So what do we mean by diversion? While we could spend a whole webinar just talking about diversion, and really staff should receive training on diversion to do it well, we just wanted to provide a brief overview of what diversion is here. Diversion prevents homelessness for people seeking shelter by helping them identify immediate alternative housing arrangements or helps them stay where they are if it's safe and appropriate. And we'll keep saying safe and appropriate because that's just an incredibly uh, important part of, of doing diversion. We want to make sure that we're not sending people back to unsafe situations uh, or situations that they really uh, shouldn't, you know, shouldn't go back to or shouldn't uh, try to find. Diversion is, uh, diversion prevents homelessness for people who are seeking shelter, uh, again, by helping them find somewhere that is safe and appropriate. And it is problem solving and solutions focused. And it's really more about having a conversation with people, which we'll talk about in a second. It's not a separate program. So a lot of people might think, well, I don't have a diversion program in my community, or I don't have financial resources that are dedicated to diversion. But we want to stress that diversion is not a separate program, but rather part of an entire crisis response system. So diversion should be something that if you have coordinated entry, should be those conversations should be have, happening right at that front door to the system, uh, as well as at shelter. And if you don't have coordinated entry in your community right now or it's in development, um, it should be happening at shelter as well. Because you want to make sure that we're helping people uh, find good solutions. And if they don't have to enter shelter, uh, we want to help them do that. Diversion should always feel like a service. Uh, what do I mean by that? We don't want this to be a way to screen people out, right? We don't want people to feel like they're being turned away with no assistance. Diversion should feel like uh, a service and should be a service that people are receiving to get help. It just means that it might not be getting help to get into shelter. It might be getting help to get resources in other ways. So diversion happens, as I said, uh, at, at, at several points. And it might be a conversation that you have um, in, in different ways, uh, you know, throughout the person's stay. 
Diversion is not about a particular set of questions or an assessment tool. Effective diversion is really about engaging people seeking shelter in a solution-focused conversation to help them to identify safe alternatives to shelter first, instead of immediately doing an intake into shelter. Just because someone is seeking shelter doesn't always mean that they might not have better housing alternatives. And so, you know, sometimes someone can stay with the sisters if they haven't um, been in contact for a while, but really, really need to kind of have a conversation with you to figure out how to do that. Um, maybe they can return to where they're staying if they just were contributing a little bit of resources, or uh, you know, maybe there was a, an issue with the landlord or a family member that just needs mediation. So it's really important that diversion is only used, again, when it's safe and appropriate, and not for when someone is fleeing an unsafe situation, for example. Diversion should really come from a strengths-based approach versus a needs approach. Like, what does the person already have that, what kind of supports, what kind of strengths can they build on that can keep them or help them find, uh, keep them housed or help them find alternative housing? Uh, and you're assisting people in connecting to community resources to avoid that shelter stay. And this may include providing financial assistance, as I said before, but really often it's providing assistance such as mediation or connection to community resources connections to other family members with whom the person may be able to live. So it is important to know that you don't necessarily need financial resources to provide effective diversion. Not that that wouldn't be helpful as well. The next key we will be discussing, immediate and low barrier access. We will also be going much more into depth about this key element on our next webinar by hearing from shelters who have actually operationalized immediate and low barrier access. Uh, and they will be sort of talking through the transition, but I will cover uh, some things here today. So is your shelter providing immediate and low barrier access? Many people who responded to the online survey said their shelters are. So I'd be curious, after listening to more about this key element in the next few minutes, think about whether this matches what you thought low barrier means. To understand why providing immediate and low barrier access is so critical to an effective shelter model, I think it's really helpful to understand why people avoid shelters. Oftentimes, you'll hear people in communities say, well, they're just some people who want to be homeless. But really, that is just not quite the case. The case here, um, this survey results kind of really help us understand why people avoid shelters. This is an unsheltered survey of a large West Coast city uh, that was recently done in November 2016. And it, they, uh, this survey talked to um, about over 1,000 people, 1,050 unique surveys were completed with individuals experiencing homelessness. And the survey was then supplemented by target focus groups that covered uh, different subpopulations around the city. And it's really designed to reach targeted populations, including youth and families with children, uh, those staying in encampments, uh, and those who are sleeping in vehicles. So here are the results. You can see that 37% of people said, shelters are just too crowded. I don't want to be in that environment. 30% of people said, there's bugs in shelters. Um, we hear that a lot, right? The shelters aren't clean or not decent, and people don't want to stay there. 28% of people said, there's just too many rules. Don't want to be in a place with so many rules. 27% of people said, shelters are full. I can't get in. 23% of people said, I can't stay with my partner and my family. I don't want to be separated from them, so I'm not going to go to a shelter. 22% of people said germs, um, but the shelter maybe isn't uh, you know, clean. 22% of people said they don't accept my pet, and a lot of people don't want to part from um, their pet. And I think many of us could understand who have pets, that we wouldn't want to just leave our pet, especially if that's kind of our, our only family at this point, um, outside because we want to enter shelter. We'd rather be with them. 19% uh, said there's nowhere to stay, nowhere to store my stuff, so they don't want to give up their possessions. 18% said they're too far away, and 13% of people said they couldn't stay with their friends, which often comes from people who are staying in encampments where people really develop communities. So people have a lot of different ideas about what low barrier means. And we're going to try to define it here and also talk about what it does not mean. Providing low barrier access means simplifying eligibility criteria for entry to shelter to allow people to immediately and easily access shelter, not have to jump through a lot of different hoops to get in. Remember the reasons that people don't want to enter shelter that we just mentioned. We want to create shelters that are accommodating to people who need them, not make people accommodate the shelter program and its rules. We don't want our shelter rules to be the reason that someone has to stay out on the street. And we don't want to be the barrier between them and an exit out of homelessness. So in other words, we want to screen people in, not out. And we want to figure out how we can 
make our eligibility criteria do that. So when possible, shelters should remain open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that people don't have to leave early or enter at a certain time and have to carry their things with them during the day. This is often a deterrent for people staying in shelter. And as much as staffing and resources allow, and I know a lot of you don't have staffing for 24-hour uh, open opening, or you might need to have volunteers do this, um, try to get rid of nightly check-ins so people do not have to line up for a bed each night or leave early in the morning. And this is going to be really tough for people, especially if they have to take their stuff with them or they have jobs that don't quite adhere to the schedule. I know many of you are flexible about people who need to come in and out, but it is something to think about because it is one of the reasons that people sort of uh, don't feel like this is, this is a schedule they can adhere to. Liberator access also means not drug and alcohol testing to get in. So we'll talk more about that, uh, what that means in terms of keeping people safe uh, in your shelter. I know a lot of people have questions about that. But instead of drug and alcohol testing, you're going to start focusing on behaviors instead. And we'll address more of this uh, later and also when we talk uh, about rules in a different webinar. So you don't want to require criminal background checks to get in, and you don't want to require income to get in. A lot of this, again, sort of has uh, aligns with the housing first approach. Not requiring things like, quote unquote, housing readiness or motivation, because if you're using a housing first approach, you believe that everyone is housing ready, um, and you're not looking for, quote, an, you know, people to exhibit a desire to change or have a certain, you know, compliance that they're with the shelter. You, you're thinking, about everyone really being ready for housing and, and your job is being a way to get them into that. So really importantly, uh, and again this has a lot to do with the results of that survey and other surveys cities have done, allowing people, pets, so people and partners, pets and people's possessions whenever possible so people don't have to part with the things and people that are very important to them. Providing immediate and low barrier access also means that the most acute and highest need people are prioritized for shelter, such as unsheltered individuals and families who are at greatest risk for severe health and safety consequences if not sheltered. So if you're a community that has a lot of unsheltered people um, and you are, your shelter is not completely full, um, that's you know, something should be changing at your shelter so you make sure that there are less unsheltered people. Um, and you want to fill your shelter also with those that need it the most, not those that happen to get there first or can comply with the rules. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're not requiring service participation, as Anna said, uh, to stay in shelter. This does not align with the housing first approach. And that doesn't mean people shouldn't be doing anything while they're in shelter to work towards getting housed. It just means that staff should be as proactive as possible in engaging every person to have a housing plan as soon as possible and achieve that housing plan so they can leave shelter to get to housing. Uh, shelter is really a process to get housed, and we don't want people uh, you know, to sort of be staying for long periods of time without assistance to get housed. But people staff need to really figure out how to make their services helpful and meaningful and engaging so people want to use them, but it shouldn't be a requirement to stay. We'll talk a little bit more about how to encourage people to, who want to get housed in a minute. So here's another result from the self-assessment survey. 37% of shelters require participation in services to remain shelter. So as I just said, requiring services is not using a low barrier or housing first approach. So you might want to think about why you're requiring those services and how to figure out um, how to deliver those services and do all of those services need to happen uh, inside shelter and, and why, you know, are they helping people get housed? We'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, one of the next key elements. Providing immediate and low barrier access also means serving households of any configuration, including couples without children, persons identifying as LGBT, two-parent households, and mothers with teenage boys. This comes from HUD's equal access rule uh, that we will talk more about on the next slide. We also uh, define low barrier access as serving people using substances or with mental illnesses regardless of treatment compliance. And you might need to configure your space differently uh, to serve households of different configurations and accommodate special needs. A little bit more on the equal access rule here, but we will spend a whole webinar talking about HUD's equal access rule, which applies to all programs that receive any funding from HUD. For now, just note that it requires you to determine eligibility 
uh, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. So you can't ask about any of that stuff for eligibility. Uh, you cannot discriminate against anyone because they do not conform to gender or sex stereotypes. And you want to grant equal access consistent with a person's gender identity. Again, this is there's a lot going on, you know, there's a lot here. I know a lot of people have questions about this. We will do a whole webinar on this that will help you kind of really work through the details and the questions you probably have. So it's really important to note that having a low barrier shelter does not mean having a free-for-all type of environment where anything goes. Low barrier does not mean uh, not having rules or expectations of shelter participants. Safety is still of primary importance for clients and staff in a low barrier environment. There's no question about that. And all rules and all expectations should pertain to safety. Uh, so you, it's not about not having rules or expectations. You're not, um, you know, you're not trying to allow people to act in unsafe ways. So allowing people to act in ways that are unsafe to themselves or others uh, is not is something that you'll be looking for in behaviors. It does not mean letting anything happen or letting everyone in. So it's important to know that low barrier uh, does have some structure to it. It does have expectations of people. It does uh, use. Safety is kind of a primary organizing principle, but it doesn't mean that you know people can kind of do whatever they want. Um, and it's important to kind of make that distinction. A lot of people feel that, especially maybe community members or board members, you might need to educate them on what low barrier really means. Here are some simple behavior-based rules from a shelter that we have consulted who said that getting rid of their pages and pages of rules made their jobs and their environment for clients much better. We do have an entire webinar that dives into this, but I just want to talk about some of those rules here. So treating everyone with dignity and respect, using the shelter space in a respectful manner, be a good neighbor, no weapons should be used in the shelter, and nothing may be used as a weapon inside the shelter, substance use is not allowed on the premises. So in these ways, you can simplify your roles or your client handbooks and, and still kind of achieve the safety that you're, you're trying to maintain. Um, you know, so for example, if someone is so inebriated that they are in danger to themselves or others, you may want to ask them not to come in for just that night or call 911 if their health is a concern. And they can always come back the next day at the staff's discretion. Believe it or not, many shelters will tell you that having lots of rules actually produce more anxiety between staff and clients. Having enforced lots of rules creates a power dynamic between staff and clients that can be counterproductive. I'm sure that many of you have that experience. Simplifying your client handbooks, your rules, your policies may make the environment much more conducive to one of collaboration with clients. And I'm going to hand it over to Anna to talk a little bit about housing-focused and rapid exit services. Okay, since we know that a lot of you have actually been working on making your services more housing focused, um, we think that's fantastic. So we just want to tell you a little bit more about um, this key element, which is um, making sure your exits from uh, shelter are um, to permanent housing and are quickly to permanent housing. So um, let me change this slide. Okay. Uh, housing focused rapid exit services. So shelters can have all kinds of different services from employment to budgeting, parenting classes, life skills, computer classes, that kind of thing. Uh, you should be asking yourself, however, how are these services helping people get housed? What services can be delivered after someone is housed? And what services do we absolutely need to help people get housing? All of your services and shelter should be focused on exiting people to permanent housing as rapidly as possible. Just arbitrarily exiting people after 30 or 60 days in shelter back into homelessness is not a positive exit. It isn't just about exiting people quickly. Instead, you want to focus on exiting people quickly to housing. So how do we help people quickly exit to housing in what I'm sure are very challenging housing markets that you are all experiencing? you must focus any services or case management squarely on housing, which is why we like this slide uh, from org code, um, which argues that you should shift the case management approach from what can I do to help you to how can I help you obtain housing. It's all about housing. It's not about healing or fixing people any longer. Uh, so what does this look like in practice? Um, so at entry, every single client should be focused on creating a housing plan. 
Um, this means that you're identifying barriers to tenancy and also strengths that clients will bring to the table to help them um, obtain housing quickly. You're also connecting clients to housing resources as quickly as possible. Now, this could be a referral to a rapid rehousing program or parent supportive housing program, or it could be referring to other mainstream resources in the community. Every single person's housing plan and strategy for quickly exiting shelter to permanent housing is going to be different. Every single in-person meeting should be focused on a quick move to permanent housing, and you're reviewing and discussing the housing plan weekly at a minimum. So in short, something we often find lacking in emergency shelter is a sense of urgency about obtaining housing right away, which is what we're definitely encouraging your case management to start emphasizing. So here's another um, response from your shelter uh, self-assessments that you guys filled out. Um, so 65% of you said that um, within one week, uh, you're creating a rapid exit housing plan with clients. Um, so for those of you who don't create a housing plan with clients within one week, how long does it take for a client to develop a housing plan with staff? No matter what the client's situation, this housing plan should be developed as soon as possible. And shelters should help clients plan for a housing exit as soon as they enter. Uh, so one way um, we, we think you should do this is that it should be clear to everyone when they walk in your shelter front door that this place is about housing. The goal of this shelter is to help people get back into permanent housing ASAP. So you should create a clear housing message throughout the shelter. Some examples might be shelter is not a destination. Shelter is not your home. It's a process to get you back home. Uh, we're going to rapidly rehouse you or rehouse you rapidly and everyone can be housed. You can be housed. Uh, this may also mean that you'll need to reevaluate your staffing resources. What can you stop doing to start doing housing-focused services? So ideally, your staffing should include, the, include a housing locator, but I know there's not um, actually a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that we're all using to fund our shelters. So even if you can't afford a housing locator in your staffing right now, reevaluate your job descriptions. All of your case managers should have job descriptions that require understanding how to navigate and help resolve tenancy barriers, like perhaps getting uh, clients their IDs or helping people um, locate landlords that are willing to rent to them, knowledge of housing resources in the community, and an understanding of client-centered, client-driven planning. We also really encourage you to take a cold, hard look at your budget. What can you eliminate? What can you stop doing to start paying for housing-focused services, staffing, or even rental subsidies for your clients? We have known shelters that have saved thousands of dollars by eliminating mandatory drug screenings um, that they have re reinvested in housing-focused services. So here's an example of housing-focused messaging that comes from a shelter in uh, Rhode Island called Crossroads, Rhode Island. And they have this giant um, you know, board in the middle of their entrance area that used to be covered up with notices and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And they decided to scrap all that and make it clear to everyone when they walked into the door, this place is about housing right away. So they've changed their um, messaging in their shelter to encourage people to start looking for housing right away. And this quote uh, comes from the fantastic Deronda Metz, who runs the Salvation Army Center of Hope in Charlotte, North Carolina. And she once told me, I tell my staff, if you're not talking about housing, you're having the wrong conversation. So someone in the comments, which we're watching come in um, rapidly as we're uh, having this webinar, said, how are we supposed to do um, uh, voluntary services when we don't have, you know, when we need to help people talk about their housing plan. Well, I would say if all of your conversations are about housing, um, you shouldn't have a problem checking up with clients on how their housing plans are going at least weekly. So I think this is a question at your next staff meeting. Are all of your conversations with all of your staff and clients about housing? So here are some things we think you should start um, thinking about when you're uh, looking at refocusing your services and shelter on housing. Which services are focused on obtaining permanent housing? What can we do to decrease the length of stay without timing people out? Who is conducting housing searches? Is it staff or clients? How often do staff talk to clients about housing? And what new services do you need to do more of this? 
Okay, guys, we're almost there. This is the last key element of emergency shelter, and it's using data to measure performance. So I'm sure I can't see you now because this is on a webinar, but if we had a show of hands, I'm sure, uh, and I asked how many of you collect data, all your hands would go up, right? We all collect data. But how many of you actually use that data to measure your performance? To truly know if you are effectively performing and having an impact on ending homelessness, you can't just report the number of beds filled, the number of nights of shelter provided, the number of meals served, the number of case management contacts or meetings held. This is often the stuff that you're required and asked to report by your funders, and it shows how much work you guys are doing every single day. But these are shelter outputs, and we want to know what are your shelter outcomes. When you start focusing on results that end homelessness, outcomes improve. Everything you do should focus on whether you are ending homelessness. So these are the three measures we think uh, everyone should be looking at. Decreasing your length of stay or time spent homeless, increasing exits to permanent housing, and decreasing returns to shelter. Uh, so it's very, very important to know that these outcomes work together. For example, just decreasing your length of stay without increasing exits to homelessness is not a good outcome, right? We want to exit people quickly, but we want to exit them quickly to housing. Rather, you need to think about increasing exits to permanent housing and decreasing the length of time someone spends homeless. The only way to end someone's homelessness is to help them get back into permanent housing, after all. So here's an example, and if you guys open the download section of your uh, side, um, sidebar uh, go-to webinar thing, you'll see you can download this. Um, and it's a sample monthly metrics report, which we use with our emergency shelter learning collaboratives that we've done in Georgia and Connecticut and all over. Um, so every month, you should be tracking if your outcomes are improving, because this isn't just about changing to change, right? We want to make make sure that the changes that we're making are also improvements, so are our outcomes getting better? Uh, so this uh, metrics form will allow you to track things like the total number of households exiting to permanent housing and the average length of stay, so you can see if you're improving. And we definitely encourage you to start using this and tracking this right away. This is something you can start doing now, so we definitely encourage you to do this. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Cynthia to uh, talk about creating an action plan. Thanks, Anna. So I was sort of uh, seeing some questions come in, and I say I want to talk about some of them, and I and let you know that um, we are also going to be addressing some of them moving forward. We're getting a, a lot of really good questions. So from what Anna, you know, very quickly uh, covered, um, and we wish she had more time, but. Housing-focused services sort of, uh, and rapid exit services, we're, we're trying to sort of show that low barrier uh, and a low barrier shelter does not mean not having services. It just means sort of really focusing your services on housing. People often associate low barrier uh, shelters with no services or just a bed, um, you know, a quote, unquote, a wet shelter where you're not really necessarily getting services. I know that's not uh, every wet shelter out there, but um, that can be sometimes kind of a misconception. So as you can see, it's actually, a, you, ha you have services, but you might just want to focus your staff's activity in different ways. Uh, we have um, someone who, I know I'm working with a shelter in Northern California where they talked a lot about the services um, that they were performing, things like maybe that were more employment focused or life skills focused that they realized um, maybe they needed to really focus on housing. It's not that people don't need employment or income to find housing. That, that is absolutely right. And there's a lot of questions here about how can we house people who don't have income or have very low income or have legal issues. And you know we t we cover a lot of that in our uh, rapid rehousing um, training, and I can we can sort of uh, direct you to some resources that are on our website that talk about working with clients who don't have income, who have lots of tenancy barriers, and we'll talk about that more. Um, I think we'll hear a lot more about that from shelters who've actually done this. Um, and I want to also uh, another thing I want to address is how do you balance housing-focused services when people are coming with a lot of crisis, right? So I have a question here that says, you know, someone's coming in, uh, you know, uh, in so much crisis, they can't really hear about, you know, what their housing plan is going to be. So I want to just note that all of this should be done in a, through a trauma-informed lens. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about trauma-informed um, care here, but if you 
are able to be trained in trauma-informed care, or you want to know more about that, there's a lot of resources out there that you can consult. But what that means essentially is that you're recognizing people are coming to you in crisis. And everyone you approach, you're going to approach a little bit differently. So if someone is coming in in major crisis, um, you know, that might not be the moment to say, okay, well, we need to get your housing plan. You know, it's really uh, about showing some discretion. What we're trying to, to say here is, it shouldn't be months before someone has a housing plan. You know, it should be something you're talking about uh, very quickly, but we're not trying to just exit people to exit people. We want to make sure that we are creating plans that are achievable and that really, you know, sort of change the, the sort of overall messaging of what shelter is to be focused on helping people get housed. Um, I'm also getting some questions here about, you know, where are we going to find funding uh, to do this. Our next webinar is actually going to have a number of staff and executive directors who talked about what they did without funding um, and how they implemented this model, and also uh, sort of creative ways that they came up with to use to f uh, use look at funding and look at their donors and ask for sort of different things than they were asking before. So. We really understand that this is a lot of information. It's a lot of things to change, and it definitely can't all happen at once. It's going to feel really overwhelming. You can stage this. You can sort of take pieces of this that you think you have the resources for or the capacity for. And the way we think uh, we've seen and, and helped communities do this is by creating these short-term action plans to sort of review each key element. You can use the self-assessment tool that we have here in the handouts. And it'll help you kind of focus. OK, we're just going to focus on the housing first part. Or we're just going to focus on the housing focus services part. And we're going to create action steps and goals for each key element or just a few key elements that you want to accomplish in the next few months. And we hope those action plans are uh, a helpful way to do that. We don't want you to feel so overwhelmed that you kind of um, you know, feel like this is, well, this is a lot, and I can't do all of these different things. But we want to help you think about how to stage it. And so, um, you know, one, this is just a, a way to develop goals for shelter transition that I'm going to talk about now. This is just a sample from a shelter we've worked with, or actually a number of shelters we've worked with. A number of shelters created this goal that their goal was to provide shelter that is immediately accessible to those who need it most, is low barrier without prerequisites for entry, that increases access to permanent housing, and reduces the length of time people are homeless. And again, remember that we don't want arbitrary exits. We want to make sure people are exiting to housing. So if you haven't set goals yet or you're looking for goals to set over the, uh, over the next three to six months, here are some that you can borrow from. Look at your metrics. Develop specific benchmarks of where you want to be um, you know, in 30, 60, 90 days. These are some sample benchmarks that other communities have set for themselves and actually achieved in six months, sometimes three months. Um, so, for example, you want to make them to you, you want them to be really specific, right? Increase access to permanent housing by 25% over what your uh, current baseline is over the next three months. You'll only be able to know what your baseline is if you start, you know, collecting the metrics that we have in that form. Uh, decreasing all average length of stay to 60 days by focusing on housing long stayers. So you might have a lot of people in your shelter that have been there for a really long time. Spend some time focusing on them uh, to get them housed. We don't, again, want to exit people arbitrarily, uh, but we really want to make sure that we're trying to l decrease the time that people spend homeless uh, because that we know that that can be uh, more traumatizing and it makes it more difficult to exit homelessness the longer you're homeless. Eliminate drug and alcohol testing in three months. Some people we you know, do trainings with, they just say, okay, tomorrow we're going to start eliminating drug and alcohol testing and we're going to figure out what, what we need to have in place to do that. Um, and add ho housing focused activities to job descriptions. Training all staff and board on keys to effective shelter in the next three months. Uh, increasing shelter utilization. So if you have unsheltered homeless people in your community, uh, you might want to, and you have empty beds, you might want to increase your shelter utilization by, say, 20% in 60 days. Again, these are just examples. You can completely change the numbers in there. But I just want to give you an idea of what it sort of looks like to develop benchmarks to help sort of actually make this shelter transition happen. So uh, we are here at the end, and I want to tell you about what's next. Um, 
We will be having the next webinar in mid-June. The date is to be determined, but it'll be sometime in the second or third week of June. Uh, and it'll be about learning how to transition to a low barrier and housing-focused shelter model from shelters who have done it. So we've, you know, Anne and I have told you about all the different ways to do it, but we think it's just much more powerful to hear it from other shelters who've actually done it, uh, talked about all of the challenges they had, the staff that quit, the resources that they didn't have, and, and kind of how they work through that. So a lot of your questions will be, uh, you know, will inform that discussion and we'll make sure that we try to hit as many of them as we can. So if you have any questions, um, Anna and I can be reached at the center at NAH.org. And uh, again, you can download uh, a lot of the uh, tools I talked about today at our uh, shelter website, uh, which is, um, was on the first slide. Our, the slides will be posted. The webinar will be posted, and we will also uh, be sending out a SurveyMonkey link to ask you what challenges you're having in implementing this model so we can kind of help respond and help you work through that. Um, I really appreciate your sticking with us for an hour, uh, and um, we really hope that you come to the next webinar. And uh, thank you for your questions. We will definitely try to respond to as many of, um, um, of them as we can over the coming months. Thank you so much.